Hello everyone, this is Daniel, and this is going to be part 16 of my New Christian series. And today we are going to be talking about dealing with condemning thoughts and a very big topic, the unforgivable sin. Uh, last time, what we finished talking about was with uh, just just some just some general principles about dealing with testing and the purpose of testing. And we are now going to be continuing along those lines with some of the greatest ways that um, we are tested in one of the most intense ways that I find that Satan uh, comes against us, and that is within the battlefield of the mind. So just to recap from last time, we covered the general aspects of testing, and we talked about the test of discerning sin. I don't know if I specifically said it was a test, but that was implied in its own way. And now we are going to be talking about the test that, face, uh, that faces us, the, the, bat, the battle that faces us in the mind that comes in the form of condemning thoughts and the unforgivable sin. Um, after this, we will be dealing with, uh, with another sort of test. It's um, the test of doubt, as I call it. And um, in the next two videos, we will be dealing with doubt and the question of, is Christianity true? And the responses that we can give to unbelievers for the hope that we as Christians have. So, without further ado, let us get started. Dealing with condemning thoughts. Let's, let's get through the basics of this. So, the first thing I want to do before I really start to dive into my content is I just want to briefly make sure that we are on the same page. We all know what condemning thoughts are within the Christian life. Many of us have, have dealt with them before. You know, thoughts of, you know, God doesn't love you. God um, doesn't, is not going to save you. Um, you are a sinner beyond repair. You know, you can't fix what you've done. And, and uh, you know, God won't forgive you. And also the one that you have forgiven the unforgivable sin and you're going to hell. Or, you know, you will fail in your walk. You will not make it to the end. You will fail greatly. All these different negative thoughts that come against us. Um, all these different things are the, are, is the thing that I'm going to be addressing here today. And this comes in, in a variety of different forms. And many different uh, Christians, young in age especially, deal with this. And so I wanted to provide this resource to help you overcome this tremendous difficulty that we as Christians certainly do go through. So, let's begin. Dealing with condemning thoughts. Did you ever wonder, you know, how Lucifer, the fallen angel, got his name, uh, the name Satan? Or the devil? Well, very simply, the way he got those terms was actually, it's, it's all based on his activity. Satan in the Old Testament, um, Satan, the word Satan in Old Testament usage is used to talk of, of, of Lucifer, but it still has a New Testament usage. I find just the word Satan is, is more so found in the Old Testament. And then the word the devil is primarily more used in the New Testament. And the word Satan means the adversary. Uh, this comes from Strong's uh, Concordance number 4,567, if you're interested in looking up uh, the word meaning behind it, but that's what the word Satan means. It means the adversary. And the word devil, as I just said, it's primarily, I find it being used more in the New Testament. And this comes from the Greek diabolos, which has a definition of a slanderous or of something or someone that accuses falsely, someone who slanders. And this is according to Strong's Concordance uh, number 1228. And so what I want to point out from just the, the words that we use for Satan and the devil, you know, the slanderer and the adversary, uh, or rather, Satan and the devil, the adversary, the slanderer, uh, we know two things about Satan here. That he is an adversary and, well, that means that he is obviously against us as an adversary, and that Satan is the one who slanders and accuses us falsely. And we have uh, biblical uh, support in, uh of, of his activities here. In Revelation chapter 12, verses 9 through 11, it says, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser, the accuser of our brother, Brethren, who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. 
And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. So that right there, that we see right there, the accuser of our brethren, Satan here, he is the adversary, devil, right? He is the slanderer. He accuses us falsely. That is what the activity of Satan is, right? He may accuse us in a variety of different ways. He may, he may accuse us of being insincere Christians. He may ac accuse us of having wrong motives towards something, whenever in reality we might not actually have those things. What I want you to really just notice here is I just want you to be aware of where do these condemning thoughts come from, and they come from Satan. And based off of, off of what we just read here in Revelation 12, verses 9 through, through 11, we simply know here that Satan is an accuser. That is exactly what he will do. He will accuse us. It may be of sin, insincerity, being a false Christian, anything in order for you to lose confidence in God's love and care for you, and also to undermine your worth and your work for the kingdom. Satan, he uses these negative thoughts in order to make us less effective for the kingdom of God, and he's there to destroy destroy our morale and ultimately our walk if he um, is able to bring it to that point. So, since the devil is the accuser, obviously he will accuse us of many different things, but he will also even accuse us before God himself. He won't, even, he won't just say bad things to us about God or say bad things about ourselves to us, but he will say bad things about us to God. In Job chapter 1, verses 6 through 11, this is made very clear. It says, Now there was a day when the sons of God, that means that, that's referencing angels, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. So, we don't need to go any further, but that's the beginning of the book of Job there. But what we see right there is that Satan right there slanders Job in front of God. He says that if you would take away Job's possessions, then Job will actually curse you to your own face, God. So there we go. We see the slanderer here at work. And we also see this in another place in the Bible, and actually Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. I'm reading from the ESV here, by the way, uh, for this verse at least. It says, Then he showed me Joshua the high priest, Standing before the angel of the Lord. Now, then he, God, showed me Zechariah, the guy who, who, which this book is named after. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a branch plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said to Joshua the high priest, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. Now this Joshua here, by the way, just for context, this Joshua here is not is Joshua the high priest. It's not Joshua of, of the book of Joshua. This is uh, the high priest that returned to Jerusalem from the exile in Babylon. Okay, But you see that again? Satan was standing there to accuse Joshua of his sin because it mentions that filthy garment. And what does the Lord do? He rebukes Satan, and instead he gives, he says to him that this is a branch plucked from the fire. Joshua is someone who is plucked from the fire, and Joshua was then given clean garments. I think that is a very precious picture of we as Christians, of how we need to view ourselves whenever we are in, in sort of a, a, a situation like this, whenever Satan condemns us like this. We need to recognize that the Lord is rebuking Satan, we have to recognize that if we are sincerely Christians, 
and we are justified, we are saved. We are branches plucked out of the fire. And God has given us the righteousness of Christ, the clean garments by which, you know, we put on. And that is how we maintain our righteousness before God. It's not our own righteousness, but it's the righteousness that God has given us. So the devil, he will accuse us before God. And he's not just, he's not just playing, you know, it with us. He's also trying to get God to turn on us by his accusations. But don't worry, God is not fooled. Now, it's very obvious, the devil will even accuse God before us. So let me just, let me just say that again. So first, we, we've seen how Satan accuses, we know this from personal experience, Satan accuses us of ourselves. He says, you're an insincere Christian, you're a terrible Christian, you're not going to go to heaven because you're terrible. And then he accuses uh, us before God. So he says, look, this so-and-so, Christian so-and-so, is a terrible Christian. God, you need to judge them. You need to send them to hell for their sins. God isn't so fooled. He says, I have saved that branch from the fire. And now the devil, he will now talk to us and he will lie about God before us. So then he will tell, he will talk to us saying, God doesn't love you. God is a horrible God. God isn't going to do anything good for you. And we see this in Genesis chapter three, verses one through six. It says, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, and the serpent obviously refers to Satan, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, which is Eve, has God indeed said, you shall not of every tree of the garden? And the woman, Eve, said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. So what we see here is that the serpent, Satan here, he accuses subtly of God doing something wrong. He says that God... Um, knows that in the day that you eat of this fruit, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So what he's trying to insinuate here is that God is not trustworthy. God is trying to hold back something good from Adam and Eve and that God is, is in a way stingy or uh, jealous. He doesn't want anyone taking anything away from him, that sort of thing. And he basically mars God's character before us. We need to be very much aware of that. These are all different ways that, these are all different ways that Satan comes against us in the battlefield of the mind. Um, the devil will also accuse us before ourselves and before others. I already mentioned this. Satan uses this to cause division, um, in us and before other Christians in the church. And before I go there, I just want to mention from the previous point that again, from Genesis, the devil here slanders God's character, trying to insinuate that, like I said, God is afraid of us and wants to limit us for his own selfish purposes. Kind of like, you know, quote, you know, God doesn't want to share the things, that, the good things that he has with you. But that is not true. Don't be fooled by that. Now, like I said, going back to my next point, the devil will also accuse us before ourselves and before others. So I said that he will accuse us of ourselves, but now he's going to be accusing us within a group setting. So this is how Satan tries to cause division within the body of believers. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 5-11, through 11, it says, But if anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me. So this is Paul writing. But all of you, to some extent, not to be too severe. This punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, is sufficient for such a man, so that, on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore, I urge you to re reaffirm your love to him, for to this end I also wrote that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. Now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I've forgiven anything, I've forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So what is going on here is that the is that most likely the man that this is talking about is the man from, from 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1, verse 1, who had his father's wife and was getting disciplined by the church. And Paul here is encouraging them to restore that man since he repented and 
he encourages the church to not make it seem like the man went past forgiveness. And we see here that in any case, Paul is conscious of what Satan might do to take advantage of such a situation, which is either to accuse the man to himself by suggesting that he has passed forgiveness for what he did, and or to cause contentions and fights in the church, sowing division, sowing disunity, and making us not being able to function as well for the kingdom of God. So that is another way that Satan um, accuses us as, a, as an accuser. He will accuse us um, before God, before ourselves, and he will accuse us before others as well to try and sow division between us and other Christians. So, we must respond, obviously, to Satan's accusations and learn to deal with them. As I alluded before, Satan will use our mind and our emotions to get us to feel a certain way about God, but we must not believe those lies. There are a variety of different things, but the main point is that Satan is there to accuse us and slander us. And I have seen many Christians, especially newly born again Christians, who are young in years, and they, meaning young Christians who are young age-wise, and they deal with the incredible difficulty of these attacks that Satan brings against them. And we will all, as Christians, I think at one time, at one point or another, in fact, many times in our Christian lives, we will be pressured to lose our confidence in God and then waver in our obedience towards God as Satan racks up the attacks against the mind. His end goal is to devour us, to cause us to fall away, and if he can't succeed at that, he wants us. He wants to limit our effectiveness for God as much as possible. So we have to deal with these things. Now I want to discuss some different avenues of attacks. What are some of the different ways that Satan attacks the mind? Well, here are a few of them, and we'll be talking about how to deal with them. First, the first way that Satan will try and attack us in the battlefield of the mind is through, well, we already mentioned a lot of different things, but now I'm really trying to, to give a nice uh, coherent list here. First thing is worry. Satan tries to make, to, make, to make us worried about all sorts of different things, and he limits our effectiveness as Christians because worry is the opposite of faith, and we must trust in God as he works out his will in our life at this time. And so what Satan will do is he will try and make us worry about our living situations, for example. And we cannot be effective for God if we are worrying about our living situation and our needs. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 34, Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye, but if your eye is bad, your body, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you of not more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. That is a big passage there, but it also tells us a lot. Um, the first thing that I want to point out here is that there is a contrast in this passage between trusting in money and in riches for secure living and trusting in God for secure living. And so the warning here is clear that you cannot trust both. You can only trust one or the other. I will, you will completely put your trust in finances and, your, and in your resources, or you will completely put your trust in God. And I think that God will, in this life, make us face a time of financial hardship, maybe one way or another, or just resource-wise. 
um, so that he can help us and he can work in our character um, the trust that we need to put in him and for our living situation. So that's one thing that Satan will make us worry about. He'll make us worry about our living situation. And here Jesus tells us that we cannot trust both. We have to trust either one or the other. So we need to go trust in God. The second thing that Satan will make us do is he will try and make us, with regards to worry, he will try and make us worry about God's faithfulness towards us. As we read in Genesis chapter 3, whenever we talked about Adam and Eve, he will make us worry that we cannot rely on God, that God is holding something good back from us, or that God will abandon us in a hard time or because of a sin problem. He won't. Uh, I, I do not intend to say this, but in 1 John 1, 9, it says that God will forgive us if we confess our sins to him. He will cleanse us from all un, from that unrighteousness. So, you know, don't believe the lies of the devil. Read the Bible. Don't rely on your feelings and see what the Bible has to say about your problem rather than what you think about it. The other thing that I just, uh, that, I, that, I, uh, that Satan makes us worry about, I think I mentioned it a little bit, is that God will make us, uh, he will make us worry about God's love towards us. As, as again, as we read in Genesis chapter 3, he will try and make us doubt that God truly loves us in order to undermine our confidence in him. So you notice this, guys, the way that we are saved is by faith or by trust in God. But what Satan tries to do is he tries to undermine and destroy that trust. That is where the battle lies. And we cannot allow Satan to destroy our trust and our confidence in God. So that is the thing that Satan will do with, with, um, with that. The next thing we're going to be talking about, that Satan, uh, another avenue uh, of Satan with regards to, to worry, and I, and I guess I could have put it in a separate uh, box, but I'm going to talk about it here right now. It's the unforgivable sin. What Satan will do here is he will make us worry, as Christians, that we have committed the unforgivable sin. This is a very big problem that many Christians deal with, and I am going to try and tackle it once and for all so that you may understand what this is about and that you can have confidence that if you're worrying about it, that you have actually not committed it. The first thing we need to do with it with regards to this is we need to see the origin of this. Where does the un unforgivable sin come from? Well, Jesus mentions it in Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 uh, through 32. So let's read this. Jesus, uh, it says about Jesus' situation here that then one was brought to him, to Jesus, who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and Jesus healed him, so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed and said, Could this be the son of David? Now when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to destruction or desolation. And every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he binds the strong man? And then he will plunder his house. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Therefore, I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age nor in the age to come. So, the reason I had to read all that is because we need to understand the broader context of the unforgivable sin. And what we have just read is that this is telling us that the unforgivable sin has something to do with being so antagonistic to the work of God that no matter how much proof there is to show that Jesus is Lord and the Messiah, that the person in question that we are talking about of who we're assuming is committing the unforgivable sin, they refuse to believe um, even despite attributes and miracles that are clear acts of a good God and they, and they attribute that stuff to actually evil and to Satan. So let me so let me reaffirm that again. The Pharisees here, they were accusing they 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 were seeing these wonderful things being done by Jesus and rather than believing in Jesus, they said that he was doing that by Satan's power. And so that is going to be the unforgivable sin. And the reason why is because well number one, we have to understand well, I'm going to go over this, so I'm not going to mention it now. I'm just going to go in order of my outline here. But 
we need to recognize the situation here, that the Pharisees, they were opposing Jesus, they were seeing clear acts of God here, and they still refused to believe. Now, I think one very helpful way in preparation for this that I thought we could address the unforgivable sin is I, I'm actually going to tell you how to commit the unforgivable sin, in case you're interested. And that's, uh, I guess that, that could be taken as uh, funny, but probably it's not, because the unforgivable sin is not a joke. So, let me tell you how to, un how to commit the unforgivable sin. What you need to do to commit this sin is you need to refuse to believe that Jesus is Lord, hate him fully with your heart, and no matter what evidence comes up to suggest that he is a savior, even super, especially supernatural miracles, um, and attribute those things such as healings and miracles to something that is of the devil. That is the way that you can commit the unforgivable sin. You need to hate Jesus fully in your in your heart and in the, and don't allow supernatural good miracles to change your heart and always attribute those good things to Satan. That is how you commit the unforgivable sin. And so the reason I say that to you is because I, I hope this helps you understand um, that if you are worried about committing the unforgivable sin, you have not. And the reason is because you have not met the condition of being so antagonistic against the Holy Spirit. And we have to remember, what is the Holy Spirit here to do? The Holy Spirit is here to convict us of sin so that we can turn to Christ, okay? And so, for, the person, for someone maybe like you who may be worrying about if you have committed the unforgivable sin, out of ignorance, you may have done something or attributed something that the Holy Spirit actually did to Satan. But, what I want to specifically focus here is that the reason the, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is the unforgivable sin, it is a sin that is unforgivable, is because of the charge of claiming that Jesus did all the things he did by Satan, and this in turn prevents such a person from affirming that, that Jesus came from God, which is a necessary requirement for salvation. So in short, if... If you see Jesus' miracles and the supernatural things that he did and, and, the, and the work of the Holy Spirit, and you are denying that as being part of God and you are actually attributing that to Satan, what that is doing is that is preventing the Holy Spirit from convicting you. You are refusing the Holy Spirit's convictions. And what the Holy Spirit's job is to turn you to Jesus. And so if you do this, you are basically doing everything you're doing everything to not turn to Jesus, which is what you need to do in order to be forgiven of your sins. And obviously, you can't be forgiven of the forgivable sin because the sin here is to refuse to believe in Jesus, which is the requirement for forgiveness. As it says in John 8, 24, it says, Jesus says to the Pharisees, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Um... An example of this is, um, an example of demonstrating this is, of, of the unforgivable sin, is that if you have a deadly disease that's going to kill you, right? It's like refusing to go to the doctor to get the cure. So, refusing to take the cure to a deadly disease, that is what the unforgivable sin is. You are attributing everything that the Holy Spirit is trying to do to confirm Jesus as being the Messiah, and you're trying to attribute that to Satan in order for you to try and avoid believing that Jesus is who he said he was. And because of that, you can't be forgiven of your sins. The reason I say this with such boldness is because I know the the the, the words promises on forgiveness. We must remember that God that God promises to forgive all sins. 1 John 1 9 says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Um, this is a promise that stands absolutely, but those who don't believe in Jesus are already dead in their sins. As it says in John 3 18, he who believes in him, Jesus, is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And so I believe here that the promise of forgiveness is absolute, and therefore the only reason the unforgivable sin is an unforgivable sin is because this is a sin that you commit, that which is the refusal to come to your only hope of forgiveness from sins. So that is why, that is my take on the unforgivable sin. And so we must remember that if you are worrying Right. If you if you if you are worrying that you've committed the unforgivable sin, you have not because your heart has not hardened past that that place. And remember, if you're worried about committing the unforgivable sin, one John one nine cannot be overridden if you will confess your sins. Right. That stands absolutely. 
So um, if you're worried about committing, if that you've committed the unforgivable sin, you have not. Because like I said, you know, for you to commit it, you have to harden your heart. You have to you have to do everything you can, attribute even miracles to the working of Satan so that you will not believe in Jesus. That is what you need to do to commit the unforgivable sin. And so in short, if you're worried that you've committed this sin, you have very likely have not. Now, back to the overall scheme of worrying, how Satan attacks us with worry. The basic principle that I want to point out here is that um, if you are worrying as a Christian about anything, um, about your standing before God, um, the unforgivable sin, those kinds of things, many times the reason the worry is there is actually because it's not true and it's false. In fact, here's, here's the way that I put it. Satan would not make someone who is, for example, someone who is unsaved, Satan would not make a person who is unsaved worry about their own salvation because, because why would Satan want to, to motivate someone to repentance and to come to Jesus for salvation? He wouldn't. He wants, to people, he wants to keep people in ignorance so that they die and go to hell without realizing their need for forgiveness and, and, and without realizing the gravity of their sin. Now, the Holy Spirit, he doesn't make us worry. What, he, what the Holy Spirit rather does, well, I guess it depends on what you mean by worry, but rather the way that I like to characterize it is that the Holy Spirit, what he does is he convicts us. Um, worrying may be a result of, of conviction, but rather what the Holy Spirit does is he convicts. Let me give a personal example. I was convicted while I was living in my sin as, as a, quote, Christian, and I begin to worry about what I was risking with my eternity should I have died in sin. Now, that kind of worry is a completely different kind of worry uh, from the kind that Satan tries to uh, instill in us. What I want you to do is I want you to remember, please remember that whatever comes into your life emotionally or otherwise, if it begins to cast doubt on God, on who he is, on what his character is like, and these emotions that you notice, these, these emotions of worry, they start to drive you away from God. Be sure that it does not come from Satan. God, what he does is he does not try and make us worried. He says, instead of saying, you're horrible, you will never, this, you will never fix your problem. What's, what God does is, is, well, rather the Holy Spirit, what he does is he, is he says, you've done this thing that's wrong. Here's what you must do to fix it. And once you fix it, the Holy Spirit never mentions it again. Because that is what true love is. It is true forgiveness. And true forgiveness does not bring up a past thing that was already settled. But Satan does the opposite. He keeps on trying to hammer the thing that you've done over and over. And he tries to fill you with guilt. So that's not uh, God. If you are feeling any sort of feelings that are taking you away from God. That are not leading you to righteousness. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 16, it tells us this. It says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, to the throne of God, that we may obtain mercy and find grace and help, to help in time of need. So God encourages us to come to Him. If you're worrying and you're and, and Satan's filling you up with you with thoughts in your head in your head that is making you drift away from God and go away from Him, that is not from God. You can actually be sure that is not from God. You can be sure that that is from Satan because God, he encourages us in the Bible to come to him. He encourages us to come to his throne to obtain the mercy that we need and to find the grace that we need to help us in our times of need. So that is the one huge way that Satan attacks us. He attacks us with worry, all different sorts of worries. I'm just going to quickly recap all of that right there. That is just the first avenue of attack. The second one we'll get to. But here's how, how Satan attacks us with worry. He makes us worry about our living situations. He makes us worry about God's faithfulness towards us. He makes us worry about God's love towards us. He makes us worry that we have committed the unforgivable sin. And here's the thing. If we're worrying, we need to go to God. If this worry starts to take us away from God, it is absolutely from Satan. God wants us to fix God wants to fix us and how we behave. God doesn't want us to make us feel guilty and worry about our uh, behavior in that context right there. God wants us to change. He doesn't want us to, to feel always guilty. God wants us to change. He doesn't want us to be loaded down with guilt. That is what Satan wants to do. He wants to accuse us and make us feel guilty. In fact, that's what accusing does. Now, what are some other ways that... Um, Satan attacks us through the mind. Well, he attacks us by, uh, with ignorance and deception. And this is the second major thing. There's only two things, worry and ignorance and deception. So with ignorance and deception, 
what Satan tries to do is he tries to tempt us. He tempts us to uh, to follow a false doctrine in order to move us away from Jesus. In Galatians chapter one verses eight through nine, Paul writes, "But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed." As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Now, the reason I bring up this verse here is because it says, but even if we or an angel from heaven, we can be sure that Satan will try and tempt us with false with false doctrine, and he will try and tempt us with all different sorts of ideas and philosophies that will lead us away from God. And we cannot allow that. We must be sure that we will not allow Satan to to uh to make us deceived on these things other ways that Satan attacks us with attacks us with ignorance and deception he tempts us to bad methodology with others so for example being overly harsh with with a, with uh with a sinner or ungraceful um that's one end of the spectrum another end could be that we are uh, compromising with the word in order to not insult so we need so we need to make sure that we keep a healthy balance of the way that we do things in our churches that if we're dealing with a sin problem with someone that we are not overly harsh or ungraceful with them but that we also do not begin to compromise with the bible in order to not offend someone we need to guard against ignorance and deception and the way that we do that is read the bible follow it and be personally led by the holy spirit uh, these topics I've already covered in my previous video, so you can take a look at those. But I will add a resource from here, from Derek Prince. It's Take Heed Lest You Be Deceived. I, it was very interesting. I think it's helpful. So I'll be, it'll be provided in, in the description. The last thing I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be talking about in this video is how do we counter Satan with all of this different stuff? In this entire, you know, half hour plus, we have, we have just seen you know who 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 satan is he is an accuser he is the devil he is he is an adversary he's against us he's he's slandering us he tries to he tries to make us worry all the time he makes us worried about who about god's god's position against us he tries to he tries to make us make us worry that we will not be successful with god that we will go to hell he wants to make us make us worry that we are drifting away from god and that we have committed the unforgivable sin and all these different things now again those may be legitimate convictions of the holy spirit but if you're starting to feel guilty and it's making you actually not want to come to god it is not coming those feelings are not coming from god those feelings are coming from satan they must you must make a decision to come to god to come to his throne of need um, to, to come to his throne of grace and mercy in your time of need. We talked about his different uh, avenues of attack. Like I said, worry. And the second one, deception and ignorance. This just seems like a whole load, right? It seems like Satan just has the complete upper hand here. What can we do against him with all this different stuff? Well, now we're going to be covering that. Ways to counter Satan. First, this is very important. All these things I'm going to mention are very worthwhile to listen to so please listen closely first trust and base your reality and your worldview on what the bible says not on what your feelings say whenever we start to you know feel a certain way those those feelings are real they are but we cannot believe them because we know from the Bible that those things are not coming from God. They're coming from Satan. So those feelings are not really believable. If we feel that God doesn't love us, yet we see that God sent his only son to die for us, what does that tell us? Does God love us or not? Obviously, he does, even though we may not feel like it, even though every feeling in the world may be contradictory to that uh, truth right there. So what we cannot do is we cannot trust and base our reality on what we feel, but rather on what the Bible says. We must fight Satan with the verses of the Bible and the promises that God has provided to us. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, we see this with Jesus' temptation. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And, we had, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, sent him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. 
And he said to them, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan! For it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him. And behold, angels came and ministered to him, Jesus. So what I want to point out there is that, is that Jesus here, he uses the verses in the Bible, specifically from Deuteronomy, uh, here, especially with, with the first one, that man shall not live by bread alone. That comes from Deuteronomy. He uses these verses in order to counter Satan. We must do this same exact thing, but I'm talking on a more broader scope. Um, I think that one helpful thing whenever Satan comes with, uh, um, against us with these condemning thoughts is we need to respond with what the scripture says, not on how he's trying to make us feel. And so what I would suggest to you is that we need to see what the Bible says with regards to maybe specific things that we're dealing with. So let's just take the things that I, that I already mentioned, so how Satan commonly attacks us. He attacks us with um, worrying about our needs. Well, there are some verses that we have in the Bible that can take care of that. So if, the, if, if Satan is tempting you or saying that God won't take care of your needs, you need to be worrying, then you can just simply, you know, you, you can use verses against that. We already... Uh, have the verse from Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 35. You can quote that to reaffirm that, that you are valuable, that God will take care of you. Some other ones are like 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 8 through 9, which says, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, He has dispersed abroad, He has given to the poor, His righteousness endures forever. Another one is Philippians 4, chapter 19. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in, in glory by Christ Jesus. So those are two ways to respond to that. What about verses against worrying about God's faithfulness towards us? Because that's another way uh, Satan tempts us. Well, Jeremiah 17, verses 7 through 8 says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river and he will not fear when heat comes but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought nor will cease from yielding fruit another one is jude um an, another another one is is jude chapter 1 verses 24 through 25 now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to god our savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forever amen so there's more. There's 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 a lot of things here. Even one Thessalonians chapter five verses twenty three through twenty four. Now my God, now that may the God of peace Himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. So again, we don't have to worry about God's faithfulness towards us because these verses reaffirm God's faithfulness towards us. What about verses about worrying about God's love towards us? That's another one. Well. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, one of my favorites. Cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Psalm 27, verse 10. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. About verses against the condemnation of sin. If, if, if Satan keeps on battering you that you've been involved in a sin that you're genuinely trying to overcome. Well, John 3, 18. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who believes not is condemned already. For, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And even Romans 8, 1, There is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, I want to make a note here. If you are involved in a sin, you, you have to change, okay, by the Holy Spirit's power. He will help you with that. There must be a battle. There must be a fight. What I don't want is there, there doesn't need to be condemna condemnation. There needs to be determination in the Holy Spirit to overcome the sin. Not condemnation, but determination, okay? Two different things. The second piece of advice that I'll use, besides, you know, using verses to, to counter uh, Satan whenever he gives you these thoughts, right? So, again, like if Satan says, oh, you're a horrible sinner, well, I'm not condemned. It says there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It is written like that, Satan. 
right? We respond the way that Jesus responded. And this, I think, helps us internalize what God's promises are for us. And this helps us to be more confident towards God because we know what the Bible says. Now, of course, you should make your own list of different verses that you like to use in order to deal with the specific problems that you may be dealing with. But I think this is one very helpful way to deal with Satan's accusations. The second one is another very big one, and it is use the weapon of praise. I have given this advice to, to, to people before, and I've used this advice myself, and I can say that people have told me and found that it works for them. So let me give you a situation here, right? You've been receiving all these condemning thoughts, all these horrible thoughts, right? The devil is annoying you with all this hardship. Well, you think to yourself, wouldn't it be great to find a way that you can make him stop, you know, to shut up or even begin uh, to make, you know, him suffer for what he has been doing to you? Well, there is a way. The way to do that is to praise God. In Psalm 8, uh, in Psalm 8 verse 2, it says, Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength. Now, Jesus actually quotes this again um, in, in a verse in Matthew. It's a shame I actually don't have it written down here. But um, Jesus requotes this. And in that requote from Matthew, he says, You have ordained praise. This was, this was on Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. And then it continues, because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. Notice that latter part right there, that you may silence the enemy and the, and the avenger. Who's the enemy? Well, an enemy is an adversary. Who's the adversary? Satan. So what Derek Prince, uh, in one of his teachings that I have seen a uh, time ago, is that what we can do is we can silence, we can silence Satan and his condemnations through praise. Derek Prince uh, told a story where, where, uh, where two Russian women were in his home in Jerusalem, and a man came in who was recently out of prison, and those women who were praising God, you know, started to annoy the man. And the man was like, that's it, I'm going home. And, um, and the man's wife told Derek Prince that he had a problem with a demon. And, and um, Derek Prince responded, look, if you leave now, the demon will go with you. But if you stay, the demon will leave without you. And so over the course of the night, as the, these Russian women were praising God, the man found himself delivered. And so it's, it, that, that shows that praise can, can actually be a very instrumental thing in deliverance. With praise, uh, doing, uh, praising God in the midst of your troubles with these condemning thoughts, what this does is this reorients your focus on the problem to focusing on God's greatness. And this rewires the way that you think that it's not about my problems, but it's about what I am what I am with God. You know, instead of worrying about the condemning thoughts like you're going to hell, well, guess what? Fine. You know, shut up, Satan. I'm just going to praise God. You know, and then you start to praise God and the devil gets annoyed. Now, what I do want to mention with the weapon of praise here is that you may get retaliation from the demons, uh, especially initially. But I believe that if you go on long enough with this, if you make it a constant habit to use these condemning thoughts actually as a reminder for you to praise God, and you do not allow these demons to stop you, they will get miserable and they will and they will even stop because they will be like, every time I give this person a condemning thought, all they do is is they end up praising God because it's just their reminder for them to praise God. So try try the weapon of praise whenever next whenever next time Satan gives you a ton of condemning thoughts. It has worked for people in the past. Um, it has worked for 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 me, even though uh, it's a very discouraging thing to try and praise God, even in the midst of of whenever you're really down. But give it a try, right? Just start praising God from the mouth. If if you need help, you can even go start reading the Psalms out loud, which give praise to God. And that is, I think, a very good way to go about that. So let us review that. How can we deal with Satan with all these things? Well, first, with with regards to Satan's weapon against uh, worry, we want to use the weapon of praise. We want to use um, we want to use verses from the Bible and base our reality on what the Bible says, response to Satan with uh, verses from the Bible. And also we want to, uh, with regards to um, Satan uh, trying to deceive us with false doctrines, we just need to know what the Bible says. Read your Bible, follow it, and be personally led by the Holy Spirit. So anyway, that will be everything for this uh, part here, dealing with, con with condemning thoughts and the unforgivable sin. I hope that it was edifying. I hope that it was helpful. And we'll see you in the next part. So be blessed in Jesus' name and have a wonderful day.